We are wrapping up our series called Believe. I've really enjoyed this series, and um, it's been something that that I feel that um, has really benefited my life, Um, and so hopefully you feel that it has benefited yours. Um, Today I want to share a message that I'm calling Mistaken Identity, and I want to start by just, uh, just... telling you that uh, my, my wonderful wife, my, my lovely daughter-in-law, they like to watch a, a program called Dateline on NBC, okay? Now, I refer to this as the show that shows wives how to murder their husbands and get away with it, okay? Because that's really, it's, it's kind of like the Hallmark Channel on murder and news, okay? It's the same plot. It's the same characters week after week, you know, and, and they love to watch that. And, and Benjamin and I will be working on a project and we'll walk in the room and, we're, and they're, they're like, you know, taking notes, you know. I'm like, this, this looks bad for me, you know, it's just what I'm saying. Um, but but uh, um, it's amazing how many times the police have the wrong suspect in mind. Have you ever noticed that? They initially, they are never on the right person. They always, and it looks obvious. It's a slam dunk and they've got the wrong person because eventually some sort of evidence comes into play that nobody realized the first time through the house. It's, it's, it's either blood or it's some form of DNA. It's a, it's a fingerprint. There's a witness that they didn't initially interview, and it just it breaks the case wide open. And all throughout the month of December, we've been looking at evidence that surrounds the birth of Jesus Christ. Now, it is true that that I cannot, in fact, no one can satisfy um, every every bit of, of, uh, you, you can't provide proof for everything that there is about Jesus in order to convince someone simply through through the use of proof uh, that Jesus is who he claims to be. But I, I want us to, as we wrap up this, this series today, I just, I just want to touch on a couple things that we talked about in the series, and then I want to talk about three arguments that, that really um, kind of do away with this idea of mistaken identity. The first thing that we really began talking about in our series was proximity. Uh, the closer an eyewitness is to an event that happens the more reliable their testimony is. If it happened uh, 200 yards away from them, they may not be able to be a reliable witness. But if something happened right in front of someone, that's completely different. The amount of time that's gone by between an event happening and the time someone gives their account makes a very significant difference. We talk about burden of proof and in determining the historical accuracy of the Bible when it comes to things about Jesus, the responsibility for the burden of proof has always been placed on the Bible itself. I told you that a couple of weeks ago that while I was preparing my message and I was, I was talking about uh, how in scripture it mentions names and, and people said, no, that can't be right because this guy, he did that. And while I was preparing my message, someone called me looking for a different Kevin Taylor. Okay. You remember me telling you that if you were here a couple of weeks ago? Well, let me tell you this. I got another call this week from the same office looking for that other Kevin Taylor again, okay? And at what the scripture says, it'll be confirmed in the mouth of two or three witnesses. I'm telling you, it's easy to have mistaken identity. But I, 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 as we, we look at this idea of, of identity and names and things like that, I love to listen to kids and the way kids talk. And, and kids will use words that are really popular in school, okay? 
Um, for a while, Isaac in middle school was using the word epic, and I loved it because it didn't matter what they were talking about. Kid just kind of throws his head back, epic, you know, and I love that. And I would, I would, so, okay, I was probably teasing, but I would say epic, you know, and I would just use that. And then now I'm told, dad, that's middle school, you know, I, I just, you know, it, at times they really change. But words and how we use them are important. And Luke, in his gospel, uses a word, and it's translated in English as official. And and people thought that's, that's proof that Luke could not have been accurate because that word, that word in, in the, the first century, it was not used. That was a word that just, it was not something that, that he would have he would have accurately written about. And so therefore his account must not be true. But then we find that archaeologists have literally dug up 35 different uses of that word very publicly um, and, and, and literally using them on monuments and arches and entrances to cities. Um, and so what, what was thought by some people to be uh, impossible to be accurate, now we understand that Luke was actually correct. There was a well-known archaeologist that, that did a detailed examination of, of every geographical location that Luke mentioned between his gospel and the book of Acts. 32 countries, 54 cities, and 9 islands were mentioned in those two books, and it was determined that he did not make a single error. And so we read, as as we read the scripture, we understand that there are certain things that can be confirmed. Throughout the Old Testament, and I talked about this on Christmas Eve, The Old Testament paints a picture of what the Messiah would look like. Not a physical picture, but a characteristic of what he should look like. We we know, according to to scholars, that there there are 300, more than 300 prophecies in the Old Testament, referring to the Messiah, they're contained in, in some 600 different verses in the Old Testament. And, and we know that even, even if we looked at three of them, which is what we did on Christmas Eve, we looked at three of the most well-known prophecies. The fact that David, or that, that Jesus uh, would be born, uh, the Messiah would be born in the line, in the family of David, that he would be born of a virgin, and that he would be born in the city of Bethlehem. That literally just those those, those small things that we celebrate every year, that if, if, if someone were to fulfill only eight of the 300 prophecies, mathematically that works out to one uh, out of, or one in 10 to the 17th power. That's the chances that someone could fulfill just eight of those prophecies. So I want to look at these three different arguments that I, I mentioned to you earlier that I think uh, can all be explained by by mistaken identity. The first argument that I want to share with you is called the coincidence argument. The coincidence argument states that, that Jesus merely coincidentally or accidentally fulfilled these prophecies found in the Old Testament. In fact, because of that, others too might be able to fulfill those prophecies. So let me let me give you an example of what this really really means. It means that while Jesus hung on the cross as Matthew records, Jesus says, "My God, my God, why have you forsaken me?" That's something that we read often at Easter time. But where did those words come from? Well, the historical veracity of Jesus' crucifixion is, it's not just widely accepted, it is just accepted as historical fact in general by by most, if not all, scholars and all historians. But Matthew himself, he was an eyewitness to the crucifixion, and so he recorded Jesus' words. And we would say, you know, that looks a little bit suspicious when we read Psalm 
chapter 22, written a thousand years earlier, Psalm 22, 1, where the psalmist writes this, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, one of the thieves that hung uh, uh, on Jesus left and right, there were two, one on his left, one on his right. One of those thieves, they, they could have said the same phrase. <clears throat> More than likely, they, they knew the Psalms. They certainly knew the prophets. But someone could say that, you know, Jesus, while he was hanging on the cross, he might have, uh, you know, just it was coincidental that he that he said these words from Psalms. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And what that would mean is that Jesus, hanging on a cross with nails in his wrists, nails in his feet, a crown of thorns on his head, having been flogged 39 stripes and literally suffocating and and he would have to push up on his feet for every single breath that Jesus would have thought to himself, I'm going to take a breath and I'm going to quote Psalm 22. Now, let me tell you, that, that you, you, I don't know about you, but I mean, if I've got a hangnail, I can't think about anything else. Do you know what I'm saying? To think that, that someone would, would say in the midst of the agony of the worst torture known to man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote those words so that I can appear to be fulfilling those words. Or that those words would have somehow been just coincidentally flowing off Jesus' lips. You know, I thought about this and I, I thought to myself, okay, Lord, how, how was this? How, how could Jesus, did, did Jesus just know, know Isaiah or know Psalms and so he, he says it in order to fulfill it? And, and, and you think to yourself, why you know, in, in that moment in his humanness, he's suffering as a human. I, I don't know if we have the ability to, to comprehend and recall that. Or, or was it simply that God knew what Jesus would say and spoke it to the prophet, which I think is certainly much more plausible of how it actually happened. But what would have to be going through a person's mind to go through that much suffering and then think, hey, I'm going to speak these words that were spoken a thousand years ago because I want to be seen as the Messiah. Theologians agree that there's 300 prophecies about the Messiah. I told you about a, a, an author, Peter Stoner, who wrote a book, Science Speaks, and he's the one that, that mathematically said that it's, it's the same chances of, of one person fulfilling just eight of those prophecies is 10 to the 17th power. On Christmas Eve, I shared the idea that, that what that would look like is, is putting silver dollars in the state of Texas to a depth of two feet. Mark one of them. Put your friend out there and say, okay, go ahead and find them, blindfold them, pick just one. Though That's the same chances, the same odds. Lee Strobel, who's an author, he said, you know what? I wanted to take this just a little bit further. And so I wanted to see if there's 300 prophecies about one person, about the Messiah, what would the chances be of one person fulfilling 48? So he took it a little further. And he said there would be one chance in a trillion, but hang with me, 13 times, okay? Not 13 trillion, 13 trillion, 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 trillion. That those would be the odds that one person could fulfill 48 of those prophecies. When speaking about the end times in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus said something really interesting. He said that there will be many who claim to be the Messiah and will result in deceiving many. And since just the 20th century, there have literally been dozens who have claimed to be the Messiah. Let me just throw out a couple names for you. 
How about Jim Jones, who was uh, from the People's Church, and, and they, they moved to Jonestown, Guyana, or they created Jonestown, Guyana, and they committed mass suicide there. How about Marshall Applewhite? You might remember something called the hale Bop Comet, and Applewhite led a group that was called Heaven's Gates, Applewhite said, I am Jesus, the Son of God. They committed mass suicide in 1997 in order to meet up with the spaceship that was behind the comet. Sounds like a good plan, doesn't it? How about David Koresh, the leader of the Branch Davidian in Waco, Texas, who claimed to be the final prophet, the Son of God, and the Lamb? Man, they're, they're, those are just some of the more well-known ones that we've read about, that we've seen news clips about. But there are many, dozens and dozens, who have claimed to be the Son of God, to be Jesus reincarnated. But in Psalm 22, okay, where, where, where it says, uh, remember I read it to you just a moment ago, Psalm 22 in verse 1, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When it goes down, because you say anybody could say that, look at verse Verse 18, Psalm 22, 18. They divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. Now, we see the fulfillment of this prophecy. Literally, it's, it's occurring at the foot of the cross by Roman soldiers. We read about it in John chapter 19, beginning of verse 23. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares one for each of them with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. Now, Romans aren't going to do, Roman centurions aren't going to do anything to help a Jewish criminal help them do any favors. Could you imagine Jesus hanging on the cross? And looking down at those Roman soldiers, hey guys, would you do me a favor? Would you throw dice to determine who gets my clothes? That's, that's the, the sort of argument that we're talking about here. But the volume of the Old Testament prophets are too great to think that any one person could fulfill them coincidentally or that someone else could fulfill them in the same way that Jesus has. Because even those who claim to be the Messiah, they are not able to fulfill those things. Let's look at another argument, argument number two, the altered gospel argument. The gospel writers, even Jewish historians like Josephus, uh, the, the, what that argument says is that they falsified specifics in order to make it look like the prophecies were actually fulfilled by Jesus. Let's look at Isaiah 53 in verse 9. It says, he was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Now, Matthew chapter 27 records that a wealthy man named Joseph of Arimathea appealed to Herod for Jesus' body and buried Jesus in his own tomb. We read about it in verses 57 to 60 in Matthew 27. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. So Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. The altered gospel argument puts forward the notion that Matthew falsified the actual events and, it's, and, and by saying that Joseph of Arimathea, who was known to be a rich man, placed Jesus' body in his tomb in order to make it appear as if the prophecy had been filled. But when all the Gospels and Paul's letters were written, they were circulated and there were many people who were alive that were observers to those events. Both Christians and Jews who had, <clears throat> excuse me, rejected Jesus 
as the Messiah. And it would have been so easy for them to come forward and to say, you know what, this actually didn't happen, thereby casting doubt on Matthew's account uh, and, and really calling into question his trustworthiness. So here's a question. Is it, is it reasonable to believe that someone like Matthew would be willing to die? Because remember, the, the disciples, 11 of them, they were killed for their faith. They, they were martyred for their faith. Is it reasonable to think that Matthew would have been willing to suffer martyrdom for something that he knew was not true? Now, there's something really great about, about people. And that is when you believe something enough, we are willing to die for it. Right? We're, I mean, that's, that's how, we, that's, I, I would say that I hadn't thought about this beforehand, but the idea pops in my head about, about our military. We have, we have many great heroes that have given their life to protect our freedom. They believe in something so much that they willingly lay their own life on the line. But someone like Matthew, why, why would he be willing to give of his life if he knew that what he was giving it for was a fallacy, if he knew that it had been fabricated. The Jews, they certainly would have been able to come forward and to dispute Matthew's claims. Interestingly, the Jewish Talmud was written between the first century and the fifth century and is really a commentary on the Old Testament law. And, and it says a lot of negative things about Jesus, but never once does it say that Jesus, uh, it doesn't claim that his, his disciples falsified that Jesus fulfilled Old Testament prophecies. So even, even what would be the most critical of all, the Jewish Talmud doesn't say, well, we, we, think, that, we think that they just falsified these things. They didn't say that because they knew that these people were eyewitnesses and others were witnesses of the, the fact that those things happened. And so we understand that, that this argument that, that the, the gospel was altered is something that, that it doesn't, it's not able to be proved. Argument number three is the intentional fulfillment argument. That states that Jesus would manipulate various moments and events in his life in a way to appear to fulfill prophecies which were commonly known about the Messiah. In Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, written about 500 years before Jesus, it says this, greatly re uh, Rejoice greatly, da uh, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, it's, it's not impossible that lots of Jewish people would have known this prophecy. Jesus could have simply made the decision to create a scene appearing to fulfill that prophecy. Matthew 21 records it, verses 1 and 2. It says, as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. That, that is an argument. You, you'd say, well, that, that could happen. A person could know something that was said 500 years earlier and could do something to appear to fulfill that particular, uh, that particular prophecy. But the question remains, how could Jesus then have manipulated the circumstances surrounding his own death and his own execution? Yep, we can question uh, some of those things and how they happen. The fact that Jesus told them to go get that donkey. The, the thing that, that, that I would find interesting is what if they got there and there was no donkey? Well, Jesus, what do we do now? Jesus himself was showing his power by simply even telling them where the donkey would be. In Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5, it says... But he was pierced for our transgressions. 
Hold on to that phrase. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Don't forget, those words were written some 700 years earlier. How could anyone accurately prophesy about their own death? How could anyone talk about someone, someone's death and say this is how they're going to die? But in John chapter 19, in verses 33 and 34, it says, but when they came to Jesus, he's hanging on the cross here, and found that he was already dead. They did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. Even though it might be possible for Jesus to manipulate events in his life to coincide with, with one or two messianic prophecies, it's completely impossible for him to, to predict what kind of death he would die. You know, I'm, I'm grateful to be here today. I'm grateful because... I got to experience another Christmas. I got to experience a grandbaby at Christmas, which is a whole different ball of wax in a person's life. You know, I, I could not have predicted to you the course of my life. And knowing how much time we have, knowing that, that we don't set that course, that we don't determine those things, I'm just glad to be here and to think that 700 years before Jesus died, that someone was prophesying how he would die. You can't make that up. You can't say, well, it's another person. Yes, there are arguments that will be made about the birth and the life of the Messiah. But this morning as I was just going over my notes, I was reminded of the words of, of the uh, Roman centurion that was there at the foot of the cross that witnessed and oversaw Jesus' crucifixion. He may have very well been the one that brought the spear and thrust it into Jesus' side. And he said... Surely this man was the Son of God. Friends, for you and I today, Christmas has happened, but we still have to answer the question, who is Jesus in my life? No one can answer that. You might have a grandma that's been praying for you for many years. Grandma can't answer that for you. You may have a mom and dad that have been praying for you. They can't answer it for you. Only you can answer that question. Who is Jesus? Do you believe that he is the son of God? Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you're the Christ the son of the living God. My question for you here at the end of 2019 is who do you say that Jesus is? Would you bow your heads with me? As we just close out this message, we close out this service, we, we really were closing out this year, I just want to ask you that question. Who do you say that Jesus is? And before we leave this place, before we finish this service, before we certainly close out the year, that's an important question. And maybe you're here today and you, you've really struggled to know who do I really believe that Jesus is? As I shared on Christmas Eve, there's got to come a moment. You see, all the proof that we can come up with, there's a lot of it. 
but it'll never be enough to answer that question 100% for you. And at some point, there's got to be faith that enters into the equation. And faith, the Bible says, comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So this morning, we've talked about God's word. We've talked about what the scripture says. Maybe today is the day for you where you say, you know what? I believe. I believe for the first time in my life. If that's you, this, this is the greatest day of your life to believe in your heart that Jesus is the Son of God, that God raised him from the dead, that through Jesus' death and resurrection, our sins are forgiven. As I close this morning, we're going to sing in just a moment and worship for just a moment before we leave. But before we do that, if that's you, you say, Pastor, would you pray with me this morning? Because I feel that, that spark of faith in my heart. I believe. I believe. And I, I need all the faith I can get. But today I'm declaring that I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Maybe it's for the first time in your life. Just slip your hand up so I can pray for you before we close. Let's stand, shall we? Come on, let's all stand. We're going to close our service today, and we're going to worship the Lord for just a moment before we go. I pray that you will have just a great wrap-up to your year. I'm looking forward to a new year. We pray God's blessing on you. Let's just worship the Lord together for a couple moments. Thank you for watching the message today. If you've accepted Christ as your personal Savior, or if you have questions about your personal walk with Jesus Christ, we'd love to help answer those questions. We've prepared something specifically for you. It's a five-day devotional called Walk by Faith. We'd love to give you this as our gift to you today. Please contact us using the information provided for you on the screen. May God bless you.